Hello, everyone. Logged on a little bit early today. My computer had been having some problems with the Facebook live streaming stuff, so I wanted to be sure that all got sorted out. Um, so I'll wait for a little bit to get started. Um, our official start time is at 2 p.m., so um, we'll wait around a little bit. But in the meantime, if you're tuning in, um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them over in the comments section and I can see it. So I'll be answering them along the way. Um, and let me type that in real quick. So my computer's a little slow. All right. Cool. All right, so while people kind of trickle in, you can always ask questions in the comments section. Um, or if you have comments, you can always, you know, put them in the comments section. It works both ways. Um, and we'll wait a couple more minutes. Just as a little kind of introduction, if this is your first time tuning in, this is Ask the Curator with me, Katie. I'm the Interim Director Curator at the Clark Historical Museum. Um, and we've been doing this kind of video thing um, weekly. So each Friday at 2 p.m., it'll be me or it'll be another staff member. Sometimes we've had board members and volunteers and we kind of have plans for all kinds of different people to kind of host this. Um, and there is a way that you can be notified um, when we go live. You'll probably see it in your little comment section. Um, there might be a little window that pops up and say, be notified whenever Clark Historical Museum goes live. Um, I recently found that out from a <laughs> Facebook page of a guy from South Carolina, I think, who dresses up as Sasquatch and plays the saxophone. Definitely hit follow for that guy, because that is awesome. Um, okay, looks like we got a couple people tuning in. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, we'll wait a couple more minutes. Um, so you'll notice that I'm not broadcasting from the museum. Um, I'm at my house. <laughs> Um, we're all still working from home right now um, until we're legally allowed to, you know, reopen the museum and everything like that. So. We'll be getting started at two o'clock. This is mostly just a tech check to be sure that everything is working right. Um, looks like we've had a couple people tune in. If you have questions, put them in the comments section and I will hop to answering those right when we hit two o'clock. Um, welcome to Ask a Curator. Start thinking of those questions. Welcome, welcome. We've just had about three people join us, four people. Feel free to put your questions in the comments section. I'll start answering them right at two. Um, so I'm not exactly sure who's tuning in, but uh, I'm not sure if you're local or if you're from out of the area or whatnot, but uh, the Clark Historical Museum is in Old Town Eureka. Uh, which is in the northern part of California. If you go to San Francisco and then go about six hours north, that's where we're at. It's not uh, Oregon yet. Many people think you go San Francisco, Oregon. Um, we're there. <laughs> um, and we're kind of a small town, um, but we're 
the biggest town, I think, between, well, it's between like Crescent City and San Francisco, if you're talking on the coast here. Um, major shipping area, major logging area, it's kind of what we're known for is the Redwoods. Um, yeah, so one more minute and I'll go ahead and do a little, little quick intro. Start chatting. Australia? Wow, that's cool. Someone just commented, said they're from Australia. Andrew John Delaney. That's cool. Welcome. Oh my gosh. I don't think we've had someone tune in from outside of the country. Um, that's really cool. <laughs> wow. Awesome. All right. Oh, looks like it's two o'clock here. So we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Katie. I'm the interim director curator at the Clark Historical Museum in Old Town Eureka, um, which is in Humboldt County, uh, home of Bigfoot, um, for those of you from out of the area. Um, we're probably the, the biggest local history museum in this area. Um, we're based out of a historic bank building, the Bank of Eureka. It was built in 1912. And we focus on local history, which covers a whole lot of everything. Um, we have a Native American wing that talks about local Native people, um, their culture in the past and in the present. Um, and it's a pretty spectacular basketry, regalia, daily use item collection um, in its own specific building that was built specifically for it. Um, and then right next to that is the historic Bank of Eureka building where the rest of the museum is along with the Humboldt Made Visitor Center. Um, and uh, our main hall, which has a rotating exhibit every, well, every four months about. Um, we have a Victorian room that kind of gives you an idea of what the interior of an upper middle class or just upper class Victorian home looks like. We also have a new um, firearms or weaponry vault that opened in December, which feels like a very long time ago now. Um, along with a community case that highlights different local organizations um, and of course the visitor center. So the museum has been in the Bank of Eureka building since 1960. Um, so this is our 60th year um, in the Bank of Eureka building, but the museum dates back to before then. So uh, our founder, muse museum founder, Cecile Clark, um, she was born and raised in Mendocino County. She moved up here um, after going to college at Berkeley, became a school teacher, taught at Eureka High School for a really, really long time. Um, and Eureka High School at the time had a museum and she was put in charge of it. So she was all things museum. So she collected things for the museum, she expanded it, she led tours around. Um, but eventually, as the population of Eureka grew and as the collection size grew, she ran out of room. So she had to go find somewhere else for all of her museum displays. So her family owned a pretty good sized sheep farm in Mendocino County. And around this time uh, it was being sold. So she took her share of the money and she bought the old Bank of Eureka building. At the time, that part of Old Town wasn't really the best, um, but she bought the building anyway. And she kind of did some interior work to it and brought all of her stuff over and had it on display. Um, and we've been there ever since. And then in 1979, um, the city of Eureka was able to get a hold of the plot of land right next to the museum and build Neelis Hall. And that's kind of how we've gotten our footprint now. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's kind of a brief history of our museum. Um, I've worked at the museum for two and a half years ish it'll be three years in September um, and I was originally the registrar I was originally actually a volunteer then I was a registrar and then I was the registrar curator which managed the main hall displays I built exhibits I did events I did all kinds of stuff um, and now I'm the interim director um, and I got this job in January so it's been a wild uh, five five months <laughs> um, being the interim director but uh, we are doing good so if you're tuning in now, 
are new to tune in, just a reminder, you can ask questions in the comment section. Um, and they can be questions about you know, local history. You can ask about working at a museum. You can ask about our area. Uh, you can ask about lots of stuff and I'll do my best to answer. Um, so in the meantime, I'll kind of do some little kind of riffs on some other things um, that I have to talk about, but feel free to throw down any questions um, you'd like to hear answered live and I'll be happy to. Um, so, oh, we got one. So can you explain about the pass the glove thing and the 52 museums thing you're involved in? So, okay. So recently there was, um, if you've been on social media type stuff, um, or been watching viral videos and that kind of thing, um, there was a video trend that I think started with people saying like, oh, I'm sitting at home and there's not much to do. And I'm going to go from having my not makeup face and then do a sudden transformation. And boom, now I got makeup. Um, so what they would do is they'd have a makeup brush and they'd be like, oh, da, da, da. and then they were just like, hmm. And then they'd kind of go cover up the camera. And then when they moved back, they'd all be, you know, done up and ready to go out on the town. Um, and that kind of went all kinds of different directions. Um, people have called that the pass the brush thing. Um, there were other names for it as well. But there was a group of museums online that wanted to get together and do something very similar. So there was, um, someone said, we should try and do something like this. And it's it's kind of funny because I ended up proposing the thing where, um, so okay, so we work at museums. So what's one thing that we always kind of have on hand? It's gloves. Like quite literally, I actually have uh, gloves in my pocket from when I was at work. Um, so I proposed, okay, well, how about we do a pass the glove kind of thing? So, you know, you, you know, catch the glove from somewhere and then you put it on and then you pick up something cool and then you put it back and then you toss the glove somewhere else. So we did that with, oh, there had to have been 14 museums, I think, something like that. And someone compiled it into a, a video. And it was probably like an eight minute video um, of people from museums all around the world. Um, there was, I think there was someone in the UK. There was someone in Canada, definitely, um, that participated in it. And it was really, it was really actually pretty cool. Um, so that's recently been posted. Um, it should be on our Facebook page. If it's not, I'll take a look. But that was kind of a cool way to meet some people from different museums, do a collaborative project kind of thing. And it was pretty, you know, quick and easy to do. Um, I, it did, of course, with most video things. It took me a couple takes to get a uh, to get the video right. Um, one of them, I kind of dropped the glove, and I was just, oh, geez. Um, but it was a lot of fun. So check that out if you haven't yet. Um, and then the 52 Museums thing is there's an Instagram page called 52 Museums, just the number 52 and then museums, um, where every week there's a different museum that takes over the page for the week. And hence the name 52 Museums, 52 Weeks, that whole thing. So we were able to get it for this, this current week that ends on Sunday. Um, and it it was kind of a last minute thing. We found out, I think, on like Friday of last week. Um, and uh, you're supposed to do about seven to 10 Facebook or Instagram posts a day, which is which is a good bit um, of content to put together for a week. Um, but our media person, Dana, was slaying and did a really good job at getting everything up there. Um, so if you're on Instagram, type in at, you know, a little at sign. 52 museums and pull that up and you'll see a bunch of stuff from us on there. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it's another way to get connected with the larger museum community. Um, if you're also looking for something fun and happen to be on Twitter, um, you can go to um, hashtag curator battles. And that was, I think the Yorkshire, Mu Yorkshire, Yorkshire museum um, put together a, um, uh, a Twitter feed where they say every week we're going to have a different theme and you know museums should submit a photo of their weirdest object or their fanciest shoe. So that's kind of fun as well. Okay, so we got another question and I just want to be sure I didn't miss anyone else. Okay. Can you talk about the World War II posters you recently scanned and what you'll be doing with them in the future? So yeah, so 
this week we did a collaborative project with the Humboldt County Historical Society. Um, they're running out of the Barnum House in Eureka, and um, which is on H H Street. Um, and they got a grant a while, a mm, couple years ago maybe, um, to get these large format scanners. So there's a big movement right now in the museum world to digitize stuff. And in the age of Corona, that makes a lot of sense um, because people can't come into the museums and see your stuff. So it's nice to have it available for people at home to look at, people at home to research. Plus it's also just good for the object. Um, it keeps it from being excessively handled if something were to happen to the object, which you, know, you make lots of plans to be sure that doesn't happen, um, you have a version of it if it gets damaged, things like that. So it's a good way to preserve your items in their, you know, actual existing, you know, sense. But it's also good to preserve them in a way where other people can look at them and share, you know, information, stuff like that. So, um, we, I was looking around our collections and we have this really cool collection of World War II posters. So you might be familiar with the We Want You poster, you know, for the U.S. Army. And lately there's been a lot going around with um, the Victory Garden posters. So the Victory Gardens were the government encouraging people to grow their own food um, to supplement their rations, um, the rationing system that was going on in World War II. Um, so Victory Gardens were things. So when I started seeing those posters around, I was thinking, hmm, this might be a cool opportunity to digitize some of these posters, share some information about these posters, what they were kind of trying to get everyone to do for people that aren't super familiar with it. Like when I was in high school, which wasn't a super long time ago, um, you know, we didn't, we like learned World War II was a thing, but we didn't learn a lot about what was going on. They just said there were Nazis, there, there were, you know, they're Nazis and everyone fought the Nazis and then the Nazis are gone, which is super duper ridiculously simple. But um, yeah, so it was kind of cool to get a hold of those posters, take them to the historical society and get them scanned. So we use this fancy scanner um, that can scan things up to 44 inches wide and has a, a mode that, you know, is good for scanning really sensitive objects that are, you know, um, delicate to handle. And we have them scanned in a way where we could, we're going to put them on our website, share some information with them. But not only that, the Historical Society also has some of these posters. They have ones dating to World War One, though. So we're hoping to do a thing where we can collaboratively post both of these um, and say, let's look at these World War One posters. All right, now you can go look at these World War Two posters over here, kind of thing. Um, and Luckily, though, I mean, the posters are in really good shape for how kind of old they are. They're, you know, 80 years old, a little less than that. Um, and so it was a lot of fun getting to see those posters, also getting to kind of talk with a fellow history worker. I think that's always kind of fun. Um, that's probably one of my favorite parts of the job is talking to other people who are also into local history, um, because you kind of start seeing these different connections and bouncing ideas off of each other and it's a lot of fun. Um, so that's kind of what's going on with that. Um, if you want to see some of our posters, um, they're ones that were digitized not through the scanner but from me taking a camera and taking a picture of them. You can go to our museum website um, and it's, uh, if you go to exhibits, the exhibits tab, there should be one saying the World War II Memorial. You click on that and it'll take you to another website um, that has information on the World War II Memorial the museum helped put together at uh, the McKinleyville Airport. But it also have information on, there were honor flight sketches that were done. And the honor flight is where, it was a program where um, this organization takes World War II veterans on a trip out to Washington DC to see all the different monuments, tour around, kind of see all that kind of stuff. Um, and we had a local artist that went on at least one of those trips and did sketches of all the people who went, um, which is really cool because a lot of, the, I mean, some of those people are gone now, um, but it's really cool to have a sketch of them that was done as part of this kind of trip thing. 
but there's also information. There's not a lot right now, but I'm wor we're working on kind of expanding it. Um, information on life in Humboldt County during World War II, different you know kind of military installations that were added here, um, that kind of stuff, and then also the posters that we have digitized currently, and that's going to get added to um, once we get the images from the Historical Society to the museum. When we scanned these posters, there are about 57 of them, and um, it took up about 23 gigabytes of data, or 26. It was a lot. So we didn't currently have a hard drive that could carry that much information. And so we're working on it right now. But hopefully we'll have it up next week. So we have a question. Did you post the information on your museum quilts on that you put together? So there is a blog. Um, and that's on our website. You can go to clarkmuseum.org. Go to the top. It says blog at that. Um, if you want to see information from our la our most recent quilts exhibit, which was last summer, um, you can go to our website exhibits, past exhibits, and it's one of the first ones up there. It's called Sewing Circles. Um, so that exhibit was about talking about um, kind of the community that is built around the craft of quilting. Um, and there is, I think what you might be talking about is I did a little project on there um, last year. We got a grant from the Redwood Empire Quilters Guild and that was to uh, digitize our quilt collection, which means like taking pictures of it and updating information and things like that um, and updating our storage and also doing programs. And one of the things that I did while I was working on this was I wanted to focus on crazy quilts. So if you're not familiar with crazy quilts, let me see. Got some books right here. So this is a crazy quilt. And sorry, my computer camera is not really the best. But basically what it is, is it's a bunch of different scraps of fabric. Um, a lot of times silk or velvet, but could be all kinds of other stuff, um, are sewn together in this kind of stained glass looking crazy quilt. Um, and they were called crazy quilts for, you know, partially because of their appearance. They're just very eclectic stuffs all over the place. Um, but also people said there was a crazy quilt craze. Um, <laughs> usually it was men that were saying it, but they were like, I tried to put on my hat today and there's like a silk lining in my hat, but now it's gone because my wife cut it out and she put it in her quilt. And I'm upset by this. She needs to not do that. Um, rah, wife, why? You know, so... Um, I did a lot of research on crazy quilts um, as part of that. And that included taking pictures of all of our crazy quilts, both the entire quilt and zooming in on the kind of blocks that people would make to put these quilts together. Um, let me see if I can find a kind of example about that. Um, oh, like this one, this is perfect. So you see, you know, kind of out, out here, you know, got all these crazy quilts, oh, whoop, sorry, all these blocks. But then you can kind of see like there's a very distinct line right here and that is a crazy quilt block and not all the museums have not all the nah, not all the quilts have that um but many of them do where people would put together like this square first and then they'd you know sew it to this one and then kind of continue on like that so i took a picture of not only the expanded quilt but those individual blocks and thanks to the grant which was super exciting to get um, we were able to hire a paid intern to help out with this project, which is really important. So um, just a little riff on paid internships. It's really important to pay people for the work they do. Um, and that's something that is kind of a goal for me, at least to expand the availability of paid internships through museums. It allows people who can't work for free to be able to work for experience in museums. Um, and it's a way to make uh, these programs more equitable and allow different people of different backgrounds to do museum work. So anyway, that's kind of my riff on that. If you want to talk more about that, let me know. Um, I'm always looking for ways to expand that program. But anyway, so we had a paid intern that helped out with this. And the outcome from that was I put together a catalog, which is did it's digital because um, we didn't really have money to print it. Um, but it starts out with kind of an explanation of crazy quilts and how they came to be and um, 
kind of all these different factors that led to crazy quilts being a thing but then also talking more specifically about quilts in the museum collection so I'm trying to remember how many crazy quilts we have I want to say we have like 10 it's been a little bit since I've looked at it um but the quilts include a good bit of local information which is really cool so some of them include initials some of them when they were donated the person said this was a quilt that is made out of fabric from when my brother was traveling abroad and he sent it to me and I made it into this quilt um which is really cool because it talks about you know family connections in a very specific time period it talks about um the different fabrics people were using it gives you a really interesting look into how um different fabrics degrade over time um because you can see them right next to each other on the same quilt they've been stored in pretty much the same conditions for a good period of time but you might have one piece of fabric that's absolutely shredded and there might be only two pieces left of it and the other piece is fine um it also gives you a look kind of into different i guess styles of craft at the time so i i say craft rather than art um this was something that a uh, former coworker of mine um, kind of had to explain to me. She did a whole master's in, in craft and all this stuff. But it's called craft rather than art because women didn't go to specialty schools necessarily to learn how to quilt and sew. It was more of a home craft kind of thing. And people get all weird about um, the fact that... Um, craft isn't seen in the same elevated status as art but that's a whole different thing um but technically speaking it's a craft and there's a lot more that I can go into that but i'll just kind of skip it for for now um but anyway it's um you know these blocks also include a variety of embroidery stitches which i might have been able to see in that last picture but um and if these quilts weren't so fragile, I'd actually, you know, go over to the museum and break them out and show them to you guys. But um, they're kind of hard to handle when it's just one person, especially if you're trying to maintain the integrity of the quilt. Some of them are really fragile. So we try not to move them unless we absolutely have to. Um, okay, so here's kind of an example. So this was a sketch that someone did of a crazy quilt block. And these are all stitches that are, let's see which ones, square and V variations combos. Um, so when you're looking at these stitches, one of the things that was really interesting is that, um, you know, sometimes women came up with the stitches, sometimes they learned about them from friends, and sometimes they were shared in different magazines. Um, there were different patterns that came out for quilts and things like this um, because crazy quilting was actually ridiculously popular at one point in time. Um, let me move that down so you can kind of see it, but okay. So it was really interesting to see the influence at the time for Victorian women, particularly, and that information could travel a lot faster. So imagine, I mean, it's it's very similar, I'd say, to uh, the movement from no internet to suddenly having internet. Um, information could travel faster, data could travel faster, you could learn new things because you were able to get magazines maybe from the East Coast um, and things like that. So, you know, it, it talks to how um, kind of influences that might have been more regional before the expansion of travel, which includes, you know, things like railroads, um, specifically railroads. Um, and, you know, it speaks to how that information went from moving pretty darn slowly to maybe, pe you know, people moving across the country to all of a sudden you can load that magazine up on a train and it'll be on the other side of the country in a week. And then I know, you know, what's going on on the East Coast. I'll be behind a little bit, granted, but um, I won't, you know, be totally out of the loop like you might have been. Um, it kind of went hand in hand with collage and decoupage. Yes, yeah, it did. Collaging was very popular in the Victorian period. Um, you know, there were advances in printing, and so people could make these really, really spectacular advertisements 
and women would collect them, put them in little scrapbooks. Um, and crazy quilting, and to some extent, um, you know, collage and scrapbooking and things like that was a response to um, the rapidly industrializing world. So as things industrialized, and this is kind of more particularly in larger towns, I would say, rather than, you know, small towns, um, that that might not be 100%. Um, but things were changing very quickly. You know, people were working in uh, these manufacturing uh, factories, I was gonna say warehouses, manufacturing factories. And you know, you might be working in close quarters, you might be working for 10 hours a day. Um, there might be a disaster and, you know, like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Um, there was a building in New York that employed a large number of women and children, um, usually younger girls, um, that burned to the ground because there weren't any, there weren't safety features in effect. Um, but I mean, even in, even in Humboldt County here, Victorian women were seeing that their world around them was rapidly train changing. You know, you might walk out into one of the green belts nearby with your family, bring a picnic, hang out outside when the weather's nice. And, you know, and then maybe the next year, logging usually took place in the wintertime, maybe the next year you'd go out there and your picnic spot's gone and there's just stumps. Um, they were starting to notice that these forests were rapidly shrinking due to logging that was going on. Um, and at the time, there were so many redwood trees that people were kind of, a good number of people were under the impression that these trees are always going to be here. We could cut down as many as we want and they will never go away, which was not true, especially as technology got better and people could start cutting down larger and larger trees. Because originally when people came here, they had tools that might be used to cut down, you know, a two foot diameter tree but these trees might be 16 feet diameter. So it would take you a very long time to cut down one tree. But as the technology got better, um, trees started falling a lot faster. So that started alarming Victorian women and particularly upper class women who were married to these loggers um, because they were the ones that had the free time to take their families out and go hang out at, you know, uh, like a place like Carson Woods, which, um, Carson Woods, I want to say it was in Fortuna, um, and it was noted as a particularly beautiful forest. Redwood forest, you got the redwood sorrel, which is kind of the, when you see um, a lot of, you know, various different pictures of the redwoods, you'll see these really tall trees, and then you'll see just kind of a carpet of what looks like clover, and that's all redwood sorrel. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see some ferns and things like that. But Carson Woods was noted to be a really beautiful spot. And people are, there were, you know, a number of upper class women that were saying like, this is a really nice forest. We should, you know, make turn this into some kind of park or something. And they had kind of started assembling to do that uh, when it was logged and everything was cut down. Um, and that is kind of the beginning of the, what's now known, Save the Redwoods League. Now those women didn't start Save the Redwoods League, but here's the cool part. And I really like this story. There's an entire book on it, um, Who Saved the Redwoods? It's by Laura and James Wasserman. Spectacular book, incredible history. Absolutely love it. But these women knew about these redwood trees. They knew about how fast they were coming down. And granted, they didn't want to stop all redwood logging because that was how their family made their money. And that was how they made their living. Um, but they wanted to save, you know, this part, we're going to save this, but, you know, we can log this other part, but this part is spectacular. We're going to save this. So what they started doing was they started kind of talking amongst themselves. There were different women's groups at the time, you know, things, a lot of times people now kind of just branch them under women's clubs, but they were called Monday club. They were called Tuesday club. They were called women's societies, things like that. And they started talking about how important it was that we wanted to save some of these trees for our families, for clean water. That was a thing that was connected. Um, we want to save these trees. So particularly the Eureka Women's Club in particular, um, they had a lady and her name um, was Laura Perot Mahan. And she is my personal hero. Freaking love her. She is awesome. Um, if you go down to Southern Humboldt, there's an interpreter there named Griff, who is also a big 
Laura Perot fan, Laura Perot Mayhem fan club forever. Freaking love her. So anyway, um, so she was kind of a powerhouse in this whole thing. She was married to an attorney. She was an artist um, and she did all kinds of stuff, but her thing was the Redwoods. So she and a number of other women from the local women's club were starting to get into this whole Redwood um, preservation movement. So she was able to get together with the, Calif the California Federation of Women's Clubs, which was kind of new at the time, um, but that entire group had its own kind of section on forestry, which is what, you know, forest conservation was known as at the time. So they had an entire forestry section and they were trying to figure out where they wanted to have their next big general meeting because they had them once a year. Um, they were, you know, in the Bay Area, they were in Southern California, they kind of moved around. And Laura Perot Mahan and her crew of women's club women were able to convince the Confederation to bring the meeting up to Humboldt County, which was really cool. And this wasn't particularly unusual. I mean, Humboldt County obviously is very far away, but a lot of these are wealthier women. They don't really have to work. Their husbands are working or they have a bunch of money from other endeavors and things like that. Um, so taking, you know, a couple days to get up here, hanging out here for a week and then going back wasn't necessarily a big deal. So a lot of them took a boat up. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact year for that, but they came up here and um, one of the things that was put on the conference schedule was to go and check out the Redwoods. And they didn't just check out any Redwoods. They took them out to, um, they took them out to Southern Humboldt. So if you're in Eureka, you drive about an hour south. And that's what's now Humboldt Redwoods State Park. So there's a grove there called the California Federation of Women's Clubs Grove, also known as the Women's Grove or any other number of names. Um, and they brought all the ladies out there, walked them around the trees, and kind of had a conversation about, this is a forest, check it out, look at this tree. It's like 20 feet in diameter, you know, not 20 feet, but it's like 15 feet in diameter. It's huge. Um, and here's the thing, because now that there's this, um, the Redwood Highway was starting to become more and more of an actual road, it was becoming easier um, for loggers to get out there and to start cutting down trees. So there was a uh, Pacific Lumber Company was out there and they have an entire really fascinating history if you're ever looking into the history of Humboldt County and Redwoods and the eventual kind of end of Pacific Lumber Company is really fascinating. It gets crazy, just gonna tell you that. Um, but they were working their way on logging that kind of that area. And that was where a lot of old growth redwoods were. There's a lot of um, river flat areas and redwoods love the river flats because um, there's lots of nutrients in the soil and they can... So um, they went out there, they were checking out the trees and look, you know, we can save this grove from its imminent uh, destruction if we all pitch in money and purchase this grove. So they were able to raise the money, this group of women. They raised the money, saved the grove, a da. Um, kind of got ahead of myself there. So at a certain point in time, this uh, what was it, 19, 1917, Laura Perot got a hold of these three guys. Um, Miriam was one of them. Uh, John C. Merriam, God, um, and there were two other guys, and I'm having a really hard time with names right now. So these three particular guys were pretty big in San Francisco, and they were scientists. I think at least two of them were eugenicists, but they were pretty, pretty powerful guys with friends in high places. So Laura Perot and her gang of women's club members said, hey guys, you should come up here and check out the Redwoods because they're getting logged and we need help. And you guys have the connections that are needed to save these trees. So three guys come up and uh, they tour around the Redwoods and say, hmm, okay, these Redwoods are spectacular. 
uh, they need to get saved. And so they kind of start campaigning and saying, hey, local people, help us raise money to save the Redwoods. And all local people are saying, yeah, we know. We're working on it. And the three guys from San Francisco say, hmm, okay, yeah, let's uh, tag team with y'all on that. And those three guys later went on to found the Save the Redwoods League. Um, and they kind of get the the spotlight when it comes to saving the Redwoods. Um, these three guys and the entire kind of organization they found around saving the Redwoods. And um, women oftentimes kind of get bumped to the side. Um, unless you're talking about something like Women's Federation Grove, it's literally on the name. It's kind of hard to push them aside. But um, anyway, so that's something kind of cool to know. Laura Pro Mahan is a boss, and she did a lot of great work. Um, one of the things she's known for, and people kind of debate about if she was, in fact, the very first person, or at least the very first white woman, to put her like literal body on the line to save a tree. Um, but there was a point in time near what is now Founders Grove in Humboldt Redwood State Park where Pacific Lumber Company said, all right, there's some people raising money to purchase this land to save it as part of a you know, Redwood Grove because that was how Save the Redwoods League functioned. They would raise money, a person would purchase a grove, and then they'd donate it to, um, or they'd give the money to Save the Redwoods League. Redwoods League would officially purchase it, and then they'd eventually, a little down the road, would give it to what became the state parks. So anyway, um, so there was a grove that was under consideration for purchase, but people are still raising money for it. And Pacific Lumber says, okay, we're not gonna log it. We'll wait until you guys raise the money. But for one reason or another, they decided to try and put a spur line, which is a offshoot of a railroad line um, into the middle of this grove. So they're going out there, they're cutting down trees, they're putting down rails things like that. And Laura Perot and her husband get wind of this. So they book it down there as fast as you can book it in a older car on a dirt road. Um, but they book it down there. And Laura kind of gets into the fray and she's standing in front of a tree. She says, hey, no, you are not cutting this down. You're not even supposed to be logging here. This is not going to happen. Um, so she's standing in front of the logging equipment. Her husband books it back up to Eureka and files an injunction against Pacific Lumber Company to keep them from logging that area specifically. They could log other areas, but not that area. Um, and so I've seen th things somewhere where it's like, she was the first person to stand in front of loggers and keep them from cutting down trees. But there's not really, I don't think there's documented evidence of that. I don't know if there was anyone. That would be a really fun thing to figure out. If anyone does figure that out, uh, please let me know. I will be very interested to know. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of a glimpse into the boss life of Laura Pro Mayhem. Um, <laughs> I saw that thumbs up. Thank you. I, I get really excited. So if you want to learn more about that and that entire history, which is awesome, and I definitely recommend it, Who Saved the Redwoods by Laura and James Wasserman. We sell it at the museum. Lots of other places sell it as well. They've come and spoke at the museum a couple times. They come up here at least once or twice a year to do book talks, and they're so, they're so much fun to work with. So anyway, I don't know how I got off on that tangent. Um, oh, crazy quilts. Okay, that took a weird thing around. But um, so anyway, women were worried about the fact that their world was rapidly changing and they wanted to, you know, there's this, there's this very big societal kind of push to have women beautify the spaces they existed in and beautify their homes, things like that. That's how crazy quilts come into this whole thing. So, um, let's see. So it was kind of this component of collecting things that are beautiful so you can review them later. Collage, decoupage, crazy quilts. Um, collecting little pressed glass kind of souvenir-y type things from all over the place. Um, that was uh, kind of a way people did that. So anyway, um, remember if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. Um, I am reading them, so I hope I'm not missing anything. Okay, no, I'm good. Okay. 
So anyway, that was a crazy tangent having to do with crazy quilts and saving the redwoods and Victorians. But that was actually kind of fun. I had a good time. I hope y'all had a good time as well. So we've got about 20 more minutes. Um, and with that, I kind of want to mention something that's kind of fun. So um, now that the weather is getting very nice and we can kind of go outside a little bit more than we used to, um, you know, while maintaining safe distance and wearing masks and all that good stuff. Um, I'm kind of working on an idea to do a kind of scavenger hunt around town. So it can be done a couple different ways. Um, I'm working on the clues right now. But one of the ideas I have is to give people a clue, say, all right, go try to find this thing. And then they go out there and take a picture of themselves or a stuffed animal. With, if any of you guys are familiar with the whole flat Stanley phenomenon, it was a, based on a book where there was a kid that was somehow as flat as a piece of paper and he traveled around and people mailed him places and stuff like that. But, um, or just, you know, something like that. And taking pictures with whatever the answer is to the clue that's given out. And then, you know, there's a social media side of this. So it could be um, the person posts it on social media and then, you know, get entered into some kind of drawing or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of something that is milling about in my head. So keep an eye out for that. Um, it could be pretty darn fun. Um, there's a lot of really cool old history stuff around here that a lot of people don't know about necessarily because it's so kind of into our built landscape and you don't really see it once you get used to seeing it. So it's kind of fun to draw some attention to that. So we got a question, is the condor being cleaned so it can go back on display? So what she's talking about is um, we have a condor. His name is Charlie. He's from 1899. He's very old. And he's specifically a California condor, which as you might know are extinct in this part of California. Um, and that's for a lot of different reasons. But anyway, we have a California condor. His name's Charlie, who shot in 1899. He is named Charlie because that was the person who shot him, which is kind of depressing. Um, but, you know, he's really, really old. So um, when they taxidermied animals and birds and things like that, that was kind of starting to become the heyday of taxidermy. People loved taxidermy in the Victorian era. Um, it's also where you get some really wonky looking taxidermy. But anyway, Charlie looks really great, but he's very dusty. And the thing with the Victorian taxidermy is they used all kinds of scary, scary chemicals um, to preserve specimens. So things like arsenic, um, mercury, uh, and all kinds of other stuff that I'm not a taxidermy specialist, so I don't really know, but I've kind of looked into it here and there. Um, so I can't just break out a vacuum and vacuum them up and, you know, be good. Um, cause that would be very hazardous. So for critters like Charlie, we need to take them to someone who is a specialist in dealing with not only taxidermy, but that kind of gnarly, crazy chemical taxidermy. So I've been in contact, it's been a little bit, but I've been in contact with someone from HSU to see if we could take Charlie over there and get him cleaned. Um, with everything that's going on right now and the campus being closed, it's uh, kind of on the back burner. Um, plus with Charlie, since he is really, really rare, uh, being a condor from that period, and also in, covered in crazy chemicals, um, he has to have a display case that protects him from the people and the people from him, um, which we have found a case for him, luckily, um, but it's a matter of getting him cleaned. Um, which hasn't happened yet. So, um, but I do believe when did there are pictures of Charlie around? I think they might be on our website, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but part of what's also interesting about Charlie is that he is part of a larger bird collection. Um, Cecile Clark, when she was collecting things, she collected natural history stuff, she collected person history stuff, she collected rocks, she collected all kinds of stuff. And so she had a huge bird collection. And I don't know if she started it or if she 
kind of gained it when she was running the museum at the high school. Um, but there are a ton of birds, owls, condors, seabirds, forest birds, other random birds, all kinds of birds. Um, and we have pictures of all of them in the 1960 original museum at the bank where we currently are. But from what I know, most of those birds have made their way back to Eureka High School and they have like a bird display kind of area, including um, Charlie's counterpart, I would say. There is another California condor and the last I heard he was at Eureka High School, which is pretty cool. Um, if you guys have never seen a condor, they're really interesting birds. So they're scavengers. They um, look kind of ugly. They're head looks pretty ugly. Um, it's all bare skin because when they go and they eat carrion, so they eat dead stuff. Um, but when they're, you know, kind of digging around in dead stuff, um, things get on their head. And when they are in the sun, the sun kills the bacteria because it's on bare skin. It, it can't get into feathers and stuff like that because it's in their head. Um, and that bare skin helps with that. So they're kind of ugly looking, but they're huge. Like their ring span, I think can be like 10 feet um which is really big so you know imagine taking two five foot people having them stretch their arms out um and then stand fingertip to fingertip and that's about how wide the ring span is um and we had school kids touring the museum which you know we don't right now but um and charlie was on display i'd oftentimes say okay kids what, what do you think this is so people would say turkey vulture i think someone said crow one time which i was like whoa you got some crazy crows if that's what a crow looks like uh it's a uh, condor. You guys ever heard of those? And I said, no. And I said, okay, well, they're not around here anymore, but they're being reintroduced in different parts of the country, um, including Southern California and um, the Grand Canyon. And they're really cool birds. So I said, okay, this kid and this kid, I want you guys to stand with your arms sticking out, fingertip to fingertip, because they're, they might be about five feet tall or so like that. And they'd be like, what the heck am I doing? So they'd stand there and be like, hey, hey, you know. Um, and I'd say, that's the wingspan of one of these birds. And that usually got a couple of oohs and ahs from the crowd. And then usually someone would say, is that thing dead or alive? And it's going to kind of be like, uh, um, this taxidermy. And some kids knew what that meant. Some kids kind of didn't. And then I'd explain it. And they'd, some would absolutely lose it. And then other kids would be OK with it. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, we got you know deer head on our ball or something like that. Um, and yeah, so that was always fun. I I like Charlie and I like introducing him to the public. And so it's kind of a bummer that he's not on display right now. Um, but he's kind of a hazard, so. But okay, so to kind of clarify a little bit, he's not a hazard unless you touch him. If he's just sitting there, that's okay. He's not like exuding radioactivity or anything like that. Um, it's when your skin comes in contact with him, that's when it kind of gets to be a little scary. Or if you, you know, poke him and dust flies off. That's that's where it gets a little dangerous. If he's on display and he's in a case, he is good. He's good, you're good, everyone's good. So just wanted to kind of clarify that. So we've had people, looks like, tune in and out. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments section. Today we've covered... Crazy quilts, we've covered redwood conservation, we've covered condors, we've covered collages, we've covered social media stuff, we've covered a lot. Um, oh, and scavenger hunts, we also talked about that. So feel free to ask any questions you have. Um, so, oh yeah, we also talked about World War II, World War II posters and things like that. So um let me see real quick yeah so um for those of you that might be interested about how you can go work at a museum i can kind of talk a little bit about that so my background is in anthropology and religious studies um i got a degree a double bachelor's at um humboldt state university University, just down the road from here in Eureka um, and 
when I was in school, I wanted to go work for the National Park Service as an interpreter. It was very specific. <laughs> um, and uh, so I did a lot of work in, my background was in cultural anthropology. So cultural anthropology is looking at the study of culture, how people live, what people do, um, things that are important to cultures, things that are scary for cultures, um, things that kind of group cohesion, what brings people together and what excludes other people. So it was kind of a whole bunch of different things like that. And then religious studies, um, a lot of people think is more like theology, but it's not. Um, religious studies is you're looking, at least the, the approach that Humboldt State's kind of program takes is studying phenomenology. So studying what people do because of what they believe, which is really cool um, to kind of work with. And that's, you know, you can look more into the whole concept of phenomenology, things like that. Um, but it's really fascinating and um, kind of gives you an appreciation for trying to understand why people act the way they do because of what they believe in. And that can be adapted to all kinds of different things. And that has been enormously helpful in working at a museum. Just gonna say that. Um, so I don't have a museum background per se. I volunteered at a museum when I lived in Southern California. It was uh, Mission San Luis Rey, which is in Oceanside, if you're familiar with San Diego, um, a historic mission site. So there were local native people that lived there or were kind of forcibly moved there um, and worked there. There were friars, there were people from Spain, there were people after Spain, there were people from America, was all kinds of people. Um, so I did a little bit of work there, um, but other than that, I hadn't really done much work with museums. I went to museums. I liked learning about history. Uh, when I was growing up, I'd constantly fight my sister for the TV remote to watch the History Channel, but we usually ended up watching Animal Planet, um, that kind of stuff. So, and I didn't take any history classes when I was in college. I, you know, did take them in high school and all of that stuff, and I always had a good time with them. Um, but I didn't take them in college. So when I got out of college, I was working at Humboldt Redwood State Park in Southern Humboldt. And I was an interpreter. So I was like, yeah, this is, this is it. This is great. This is a first step. This is awesome. So, um, you know, part of that was learning about the natural history of the park, which is kind of a really kind of heavy focus at that particular park. Um, and many of the Redwood Parks appear because that's what people come here to see is the Redwoods. Um, but I was really starting to be interested in the people history of the park as well. And at the time, my supervisor had a history background. So he was like, yeah, yeah, you do that. That's gonna be great. Um, and so I started learning more about local history. I was like, geez, Humboldt County, you got a crazy history, but it's really interesting. So I got into history kind of that way. Um, and then I had been volunteering at the museum on my weekends from the park and a job opened up and I took it and I've been here ever since. Um, so my way into museums, I feel like is different than a lot of people, but in some ways it's not. So a lot of people say the best way to get into a museum is by volunteering, which I would say is pretty darn true. Um, because if you're, you know, you have a museum training background, but you have no experience, you might not get hired because experience matters a lot because what you learn in school and what you end up doing in the workplace is sometimes very different which is really interesting a lot of people don't realize that so having that experience is really important even if it's volunteer experience because especially being a volunteer you have depending on where you're volunteering at there is a lot more flexibility if you say okay so i have options like at the clark we have our volunteer docents that hang out and talk to the public. We have our people who lead school tours that interact with kids, which is definitely not for everyone. Um, it can be kind of scary, but some people really love it and that's awesome. And then we have people that work behind the scenes, working with the collections. We have people that come in and just help me move stuff. Um, there's a lot of different ways to get involved in a museum. And when you're volunteering, that's a really nice way to say, okay, like this is what I'm kind of interested in doing. Can I gain experience doing this? And depending on who you're working with, they might say, yeah, we got a project dealing with, you know, moving stuff, or we have a project dealing with updating our database, like that kind of thing. Um, so it's a great way to kind of figure out what you want to do. 
but also if you do have the chance to work at a small town museum and you're brand new to the museum field that's also a great opportunity to try a bunch of stuff so at the at the clark we have me and then we have our registrar and then we have our social media outreach events person and then we have our maintenance guy so it's a small staff it's me full-time and then two part-time people and another part-time person who's our maintenance guy um so we all kind of wear many different hats um so you know you can gain experience doing admin stuff you can gain experience doing um let's see doing exhibits you can gain experience fundraising grant writing all kinds of stuff and for me that's been really interesting because then it kind of fig it makes me think hmm, okay so what what part of museums really appeals to me? Um, so volunteering can help with that. Working at a small town museum can help with that. Um, but yeah, experience is super, super important. Um, and yeah, I guess, um, yeah, that's um, kind of what I got to say about getting into museum work um and internships as well so like i mentioned before it's really important to have paid internships a lot of them still now are unpaid so you're basically volunteering but you know internships really the main distinction between internships and volunteering is internships you usually get school credit for it um but like depending on where you go like at the at the clark um our interns and our volunteers sometimes could do the same projects. It's just a matter of this person's getting school credit and this person is just kind of doing it out of their own time. Um, but uh, what was I going to say with that? But yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I kind of kind of irks me a little bit about um, internships through school is that you're you're paying to get the credit and you're working and you're not getting paid so you're paying to gain experience but i don't know it's it's something i've always kind of been about so if you know you don't want to use those extra credits or whatnot for an internship that shows up on your you know transcripts or whatnot you can just volunteer you know, so, it, and it's kind of up to everyone for their own kind of how they want to do that. Because I mean, with internships and resumes, like you can include those on a resume and say, I volunteered at this place for two semesters or whatnot. And it, I would view it kind of the same, you know, just the fact that I interned and I did work here, I would kind of, I wouldn't say, oh, this person got credit for their internship, so that means more than the person who volunteered but didn't get credit, you know, kind of like that. That's how I see it, you know, and I'm kind of a newer director kind of person, so, you know, that I'm not saying that's what everyone thinks, but that's kind of where I stand in it. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of that. Um, yeah, experience. Education is definitely important um, as well, but you really got to remember to not say, okay, I took all these classes, I got all these classes, and now I can go get a job in any museum. It's not necessarily how it works. Um, networking, networking, super important, super duper important. Um, you know, if you move to a new place and you're like, oh, I want to get into the history world, volunteer, meet people start talking with what's going on, learning about projects, getting involved, things like that. Um, because if there's an opening, people will tell you. They'll say, hey, I'm gonna be hiring someone. You interested? You should apply. Um, that's super duper important. Um, and I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's definitely not more important than experience or schooling but it can really get you it can get you pretty far networking like that so um anyway <coughs> <coughs> okay 
So it looks like we're about done for today. Um, thank you for all of those who tuned in, tuned out, tuned back in, kind of moved around. Um, I had a pretty good time. Uh, you know, I, I like these ask the curator things. Um, kind of gives me some time to riff about stuff I'm working on and things like that. Um, and yeah, so keep tuned, stay tuned. Next week, Friday, 2 p.m., um, we're going to have another Ask the Curator. It might be a little bit of a surprise who it is, so stay tuned. In the meantime, um, you can keep tabs on what we're doing through our Facebook, our website, Instagram, Twitter, um, our email newsletter, which you can sign up through our website. You can keep tabs on our blog, which is also on our website. I write that, and it's very fun. I have a good time writing it, and I hope you all have a good time reading it. Um, and yeah, and if you're enjoying any of our content, you can always drop some money in our donation page um, through PayPal, through a check snail mailed to our building, 240 E Street, Eureka, 95503. Um, or this, the easiest way is to share this with your friends. And that helps us out a lot because it helps us reach more people. And that's a really important aspect of what the museum does. Um, our mission, I think our mission is broken up into three pieces. And one of those pieces is to educate the public. And this is kind of the way that we're educating the public in this time when we can't have people in the museum. So help us with our mission, share our content, send us questions, participate in our little random activities we do. We appreciate y'all and thanks for tuning in and I hope to see you or hear from you soon. Feel free to send us any other questions you got. Goodbye.